Uh, good afternoon, Warren, Charlie. Hi, Peter. <laughs> good to see you. I'd like to ask you what your thought process was when you, or share with us your thoughts, when you decided to share, uh, sell McDonald's. Uh, that, must, that must have been Charlie's idea, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Peter, incidentally, is in a family that, that uh, four generations have uh, essentially invested uh, with us, and, uh, and they're all terrific people, I might add. His uh, dad was a wonderful guy. The, uh, you know, I said it was a mistake and it, uh, to sell it, and it was a mistake, and I just reported that in the interest of uh, candor, and there were some reasons why I thought it was something we, I didn't think it was, I didn't think obviously that it was any great short sale or even a great sale, but I didn't think it belonged in the list of eight or ten of the businesses, of the very few businesses that we wanted to own in the world. And I would say that uh, that, that particular decision has cost you mm, in the area of a billion dollars plus. Charlie? You want me to rub your nose in? You're, you're doing a you're doing a pretty good job by yourself. <laughs> by the way, that's a good practice around Berkshire. We do rub our own noses in it. We don't even need the help of the Kenters. <laughs> we 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 believe in postmortems at Berkshire. I mean, we really do believe. One of the things I used to do when I ran the partnership is I, I, I contrasted all sale decisions versus all purchase decisions. It wasn't enough that the purchase decisions worked out well, they had to work out better than the sale decisions. And managers tend to be reluctant to look at the results of the capital projects or the acquisitions that they propose with great detail a year or two earlier to a board, and they don't want to actually stick the figures up there as to how the reality worked out against the projections. And that's human nature. But I think you're a better doctor if you drop by the pathology department occasionally, and I think you're a better manager uh, or investor if you, uh, if you look at every one of the decisions you've made of importance and see which ones worked out and which ones didn't, and, and, and you know, what is your batting average? And if, if your batting average gets too bad, you better have handle the decision making over to someone else. Charlie, you want to rub my nose anymore? No. No, that's no. okay. Okay, we're... Uh, in your description of McDonald's, um, you have the sense that there's a great business buried in McDonald's, and there are two good businesses that are mixed in with it. And the problem is with the, the real estate and the operational business, that as the company is currently capitalized, they can earn the same kind of returns they can earn in the franchising business. You were or still are a significant shareholder of McDonald's. I guess my question is, the solution is obvious. Why don't you push for a solution that creates the same opportunity you have at International Dairy Queen? Well, my guess is, I don't know the details on it, but my guess is that with 23,000 locations all over the world, I think it would be extraordinarily difficult to separate the real estate business out from the franchising business at this point. I think they could have gone a different route. I'm not saying it would have been a better route at all. In fact, I think the odds are they followed the right route in, 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 in owning and controlling so much real estate. But I think I just think the problems would be horrendous. Certainly, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to sell it and lease it back because uh, <clears throat> you would not end up with more value, in my view, by doing that. Uh, uh, and spinning it off in a real estate trust or something with operating in 100 plus countries. Uh, and with all of the franchise arrangements, I think it would be a huge, huge problem. I would not want to tackle it myself. So I, I think that you should look at McDonald's, and I don't know anything about their plans on this, but I think you should look at McDonald's as being a, a very good business, but the one that will continue in its present mode uh, vis a vis the real estate, although I think they've signaled that they're going to do less on new properties, uh, somewhat less in connection with ownership than they've done to this point, but there's 23,000 locations out there, and every operator, his own arrangement is very important to him, and, and uh, it just it would be it would be a mammoth job, and I'm not sure how much extra value would be created in the end anyway. Charlie, yeah, the net returns on capital McDonald has earned all these years are high, even though they have owned a lot of the real estate. 
I think it's hard to quarrel with the way they did it. They had a — they had the best record. And the multiple is not greatly different, in my view, than if the real estate were separate. You know, I mean, now, if you get all the real estate detaxed in some arrangement, you might get a little more out of it. But it doesn't strike me as a big deal. I'm Joe Knob from Seattle, a shareholder, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. I wonder if you could comment a little bit further on McDonald's carrying forward your comments of this morning, but more oriented toward how the McDonald's would stack up against the inevitables in international-type business, what your vision would be on their growth potential in places like Germany, China, so on and so forth. Yeah, I guess I just would have to stick with my comment that you won't get the inevitability in food that you will get in a single consumer product, you know, such as blades. I mean, if I'm using a Gillette sensor blade today, the chances are I'll try the next generation that comes out. It'll be the sensor Excel right now. But if I I will try the next one that comes out, obviously, but I will not fool around at all in between. And a very high percentage of people that shave, including women in shaving, they're happy with the product. You know, it's not expensive. It's $20-odd a year, you know, if you're a typical user. And if you're getting a great result, you're not going to fool around, whereas a great many of the decisions on fast food as to where you eat is simply based on which one you see. I mean, convenience is a huge factor. So if you are going by a McDonald's or a Burger King or a Wendy's and you happen to be hungry at that point or if you're traveling on the road and you see one of those signs up, you're probably going to stop at the — you may very well stop at the one you see. So there's — there is not the — there's a loyalty factor, but it, but it's 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 just not going to be the the same in food. People want to vary their. I don't. I mean, I'm happy to eat every day, but but most people want to vary what, where they where they eat as they as they uh, uh, go through the uh, the week or the the month or the year, and and they don't really have any great desire to vary their their soft drink the same way. It's just it, it's not the it's not the same thing. But, uh, so. There's no knock on McDonald's at all. It's just the nature of the of the kind of kind of industry they're in. The, Charlie, I can't think of anybody else who, before McDonald's, ever did what McDonald's did to create a chain of restaurants on such a scale uh, that 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 worked. Oh, Howard Johnson's tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of failures. Or uh, some of you are old enough around Omaha to remember Reed's. Harkerts or Harker Harkets hamburgers Harkets wholesome hamburgers right yeah and they Three came and, and they went those those chains and uh, but the it is a much tougher business that McDonald's is in it's price sensitive too I mean obviously it, uh, part of that's comparative you can you could spend a lot more money on hamburgers in the course of a year than razor blades. I mean, you can't save that much by changing razor blades. Yeah, the average person will buy 27 in the United States, 27 sensor excels a year. You know, that's one every roughly 13 days. And uh, I don't know what the retail price is because they give them free to us as directors. But uh, the, you know, if they're a dollar, it's 27 bucks. I mean, and and and. Uh, it makes a lot of difference. That, that's what's happening, of course, around the world is people that are using cheap double-edged blades or whatever is they, they keep moving up the comfort scale and the comfort uh, ladder. And 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 Gillette is a direct beneficiary of that. And the difference between having great shaves and very so-so shaves and lots of nicks and scratches and everything is ten bucks a year or twelve bucks a year. I mean that 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 is not that's not going to cause many people to change their their habits and. Uh, uh, incidentally, the sensor for women has just been a huge success. That, that uh, uh, I think they've had more more razors go out on that than, than the same period when the original sensor was came out for men. That, uh, uh, so that's that, that's been an enlargement of the market. I would not have guessed that would work that well. Before that, all the women just uh, 
use the disposables or, or, or their, their husband's boyfriend's razor, but thank God they've gotten over that. 